I'm excited this morning to have a friend, Mike Negley, is going to come up and share with us. Last couple of days, Kelly and I got to uh, uh, be over at Reliance Church. We were doing a two-day seminar on really about teaching the Bible, uh, how to study the Bible, and how to present the Bible. And, and so with that, you know, with all of us in whatever trade you're in or whatever you do, there's always that continual, perpetual learning that you do. And it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I love it. It's obviously, it's what I do. It's what I love to do. But I'm always learning. And uh, for the last couple of years going to CGN, which is Calvary Global Network. Um, I've heard Mike a number of times, got to know him a little bit better this last year, and I I love him. He is from... Cork, Ireland, and uh, he has the, he's the lead pastor of the Calvary Cork there, and so he'll give us a little bit more background on him, uh, but personally, what I've been learning a lot about uh, lately is Christ-centered preaching, and uh, really the building blocks on how to do that. Of course, we make Jesus as the center of, of you know, how we live and who we are and the Bible and all of that, but uh, just learning some beautiful steps on, on that and just uh, uh, really appreciate Mike and doing that. So if you'll welcome up Mike with me, I'm really happy to, uh, for you to be able to hear him. Oh. So very kind. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. Um, I've been reading Brian's notes for the past couple of years. As I've been teaching through Corinthians, I've been finding his notes online and trying really hard not to steal everything. Uh, but really, be, anyway, he's a preacher's preacher. Um, that's enough of the, uh, the pleasantries. He says something nice about me. I say something nice about him is what we do. Um, no, hey, and listen, as I've been talking, I, I was introduced as being from Cork, Ireland. As soon as I opened my mouth, I know that I disappointed everyone. <laughs> You were hoping that I'd have a cool Irish accent, but actually I have a Fallbrook accent. So I was born and raised in Fallbrook, California, um, lived the first 20 years of my life in Fallbrook, and then um, I yeah, moved over to Cork, Ireland as a missionary, now church planter and pastor, and so I've lived there for 20 years. So half my life has been in this region, and then half my life so far, I'm hoping it's not actual half. hope there's more. There's more after this is what I'm hoping. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about like, like where I started and where I, where I got there. I have a, a wife, uh, Rachel. She's from Fallbrook originally as well. We have uh, three kids, um, Owen, who's 17, and he has um, autism and some other additional developmental challenges, and then um, Rosie and Finn. So that makes the, the five uh, Neglias. That's a bit of who we are, uh, but you didn't come to church today to learn about Mike Neglia. You came to church to hear the good news of Jesus. And so let's, let's get to work. Um, if you have a Bible, could you please open it up? I got to clap already. That's great. You don't want to hear about my life. Yeah, we don't care about your life. <laughs> uh, John chapter 20 is where we're going to be spending our time. Um, Really appreciate, uh, yeah, just the, the celebration of Christ as we've been able to, to sing together of his, his grace, um, the power of his risen life. And since he is risen and he's alive, that means that we're alive and this changes everything. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, John chapter 20 is, the first part of it is about uh, the discovery of the empty tomb. And then people figuring out, what does this mean? What could this mean? The the tomb is empty. And then I want to start in verse 11. And I'm going to read kind of a big chunk all the way down to verse 18, uh, where it moves from the discovery of the empty tomb to the risen Jesus' discovery of Mary. And so we're going to meet afresh the risen Jesus this Sunday morning. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she stood, she, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated where the body of Jesus had been laid, one at the head and one at the feet. Uh, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they've taken away my Lord, and I, I don't know where they laid him. Having said this, she turned around And she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Uh, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and, and I will take him away. 
Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Uh, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Let's pray. We thank you that not only that the tomb is empty, but Jesus, that you are risen. Uh, thank you that there is no explanation um, that can uh, convince us otherwise of the fact, of the account, that the same one who died upon the cross and was laid into the tomb also walked out victorious, and he lives and reigns forevermore. Uh, we're not gathered here to commemorate a good man who died a long time ago, but we're here to worship the king who is ruling and reigning even right now. Uh, Jesus, we declare that you are Lord and that you are King. Help us. My hope and prayer is that when we conclude our time together, that we can be a little bit like Mary Magdalene and we could say, I have seen the Lord. Um, so Jesus, would you show yourself in the pages of Scripture? Spirit, would you help both me as I teach and preach and all of us as we hear and read along and consider the implications of these things together? I pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So I, I've got about 35 minutes to talk. Actually, about 30, because I spent so long with the introduction. I got 30 minutes. Here is what I want to say over the course of the next 30 minutes. I've summarized it into a little sentence for you. If you want to take notes, this sentence is all you need. So if you could write this down, that's everything I want to say. I'm going to expand on this for the next few moments. The resurrected Jesus brings lasting restoration to broken people and to a broken world. And so when you sing, you begin with do, re, mi. When you read, you begin with ABC. And when you start this sermon, you begin with the resurrected Jesus. So let's talk about the resurrected Jesus. You see, we have this account of Mary encountering uh, the real living Jesus. You see, Christianity at its core, it's not a philosophy. Uh, it's not a series of life hacks. Um, it's not ways for us to kind of view the world through a different lens. Of course, there's philosophical implications. And of course, it changes the way that we live and that we die. But ultimately, Christianity is based on a historical event that took place on a Sunday morning, not too dissimilar to this. About 2,000 years ago, something happened. And Christianity is the result. Jesus walked out of the tomb. He is alive. And we are invited. In fact, we're, we're summoned to change the way that we live and that we think based on the fact of this resurrection. And, you know, the authors of the New Testament, they are um, deliberate in showing us uh, again and again that this, this took place. And this is a, a story. It's not a metaphor. It's not a simile or a... a I wasn't good in English class, so I don't know any more of these things. <laughs> We're told this as if it's history, because, because it is. And I think there's, there's dozens of compelling reasons to, to believe this. And I just want to highlight one or two of them. If you have more, I'd love to talk with you afterwards about more of the reasons why this is compelling. But, but one of the things that I'm compelled by is how in the accounts, it includes details that, that seem insignificant. Um, and that's how like accurate and history works. Uh, it's not written like in a screenplay where everything is, is beautiful and perfect. We see kind of like messiness and, and confusion in here. We, we don't don't have the wise disciples realizing this based on their own intuition, but they're, they're kind of fumbly bumbly and figuring things out. And, and, and here we see this. Also, the prominent role of Mary Magdalene and other women um, in this story, it's, it's not the sort of thing they would have made up to lend credibility, but it's as if it actually happened. Here's a quotation from the IVP background commentary. The witness of women was worth little in Judaism. And, and that shows that Jesus, um, and that Jesus first appears to wo a woman would not have been fabricated. And it shows us how Jesus' values differ from those of his culture. Even though the later church did not always maintain Jesus' countercultural stance, 
And they would have hardly chosen such initial witnesses in an environment where this account would reinforce pagan prejudices against Christians. It's kind of a fancy way of saying you wouldn't make this up. Uh, the reason why it's recorded there is because it happened. And so that's why it is included in the pages of Scripture, because that's what happened. Also, as we read this account, we see that, that Mary was not going there expecting to see the resurrected Jesus. Um, she was not going uh, because she had carefully combed the Scriptures. She knew it was the third day. And she, but in fact, she was going along with her friends, as an act of grief and devotion and mourning. She wanted to honor the rabbi whom she learned from and grieve his loss. We could put it one way. What happened that morning did not convince the gullible, but it converted the skeptical. Uh, there was nobody that was expecting this. And in fact, everyone needed to be convinced. In fact, she didn't like jump to any conclusions. When she came to the empty tomb, she didn't look in and think, he is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> you know? And when her and her friends were walking on that early morning as the sunrise was just beginning to come up, they weren't singing the chorus of in Christ alone. You know, There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth, I thought you guys would sing too. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. She wasn't expecting that. Um, she was there because she wanted to honor the man whom she cared for, and he cared for her, and now he's gone, and he's not coming back. It wasn't until he was like standing right in front of her, until he was calling her by name, that she was convinced of his risen and living status. He calls her by name. And John 10 says, the good shepherd calls his own sheep by name and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And she was convinced, not out of her imagination, but from his voice. Let's, I'm gonna be kind of dipping around these, these verses, but in verse 16, uh, we have Jesus speaking to her. He said to her, Mary. And then she turned. And then she said to him, Rabboni. This has been called the, the shortest sermon in all of the Bible. Uh, it's one word. Jesus says, Mary. And that one word, uh, Mary's own name, spoken by the most significant person that she had ever known, well, changed her whole life. And, and it says in that verse, verse 16, that she, she turned around. And if you'll permit me to be a little bit poetic, um, I would say that in that one or two seconds that it took to, to turn around, the whole world like turns with her. Because a second before, there is a woman utterly hopeless, in the deepest human despair, in the agonizing presence of unconquerable death. But then a second later, she turned around, and it's the highest human elation that she's experiencing. She is in the presence of the death-conquering central figure of history. The rush that must have come over this woman in that two-second turn is unimaginable. And she has the honor of being the first person ever to experience the personal face-to-face -face experience of the risen Lord Jesus. So in those five syllables, the world becomes a different place. Mary, Rabboni. So the resurrected Jesus brings lasting restoration to a broken people and a broken world. So that's who we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus. Well, what does he do? Well, he brings lasting restoration. Oops, there we go. See, the events of this Sunday morning, well, they're kind of the final movement of his life of ministry, but particularly the, the Easter weekend events. His 
suffering and humiliation on Friday, his death and his burial, his entombment on Saturday. It's all for the purpose of this resurrection on Sunday. And, and the purpose of this whole event of his suffering and exaltation is to, is to bring restoration between estranged, broken sinners on the one hand and exalted holy God on the other. There's a deep chasm. Things have been broken. And if anyone's been involved in restoring a car or any aspect of restoration, uh, seeking and finding and bringing something back, you know that it means that something just isn't right and it's brought into wholeness and to, to health. So this sacrifice, this, sorry, this death on the cross, the author's of the New Testament speak of it in intentional sacrificial language, uh, drawing upon Old Testament images. You see, the death of Jesus on the cross, it was not just a, a bad thing that happened to a good man. It was a sacrifice. It was a deliberate fulfillment of all that has led up to that moment, the sacrifice for sin. And when I think about the sacrifice for sin, in the Old Testament, I think of that chief day. It's called the Day of Atonement. You can read about it in Leviticus chapter 16, if anyone wants some like bonus content uh, for today. It's like the highest, most holy day in the Hebrew calendar. It's when the sins of the nation are ceremonially, annually forgiven. Or we could say passed over. You see, there's the blood of the lamb that is sacrificed, and there would be a high priest who enters into a darkened room, and there upon the mercy seat, there's two angels. So there's two angels on a flat surface, and the blood of the sacrifice is placed there. And it's kind of saying like, God, would you look over the sins of the people for, for another year? When I think about Mary Magdalene, and she says there in the beginning, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. What did she see? She saw this surface and there's, there's two angels on either side of it. And, and maybe there's, there's blood from the corpse that was placed there. Maybe some of it had dripped onto that. And then she has this glimpse that is such an echo to me as a Bible nerd about what the highest day of the Old Testament is. Now we're leading into the holiest day, the greatest day, the pinnacle of the Christian calendar, Resurrection Sunday. Here's the point. Is that just kind of a cool nerdy thing? Yes. Um, is it also, there's a point to this too. Here's the main point. That the sacrifice of Jesus, well, it's the final sacrifice. It's the last offering. It's the sacrifice to end all sacrifices because he is the, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And, and he does so fully and freely uh, forever. You see, the annual sacrifices year on year on year, are leading up to the time when they're going to be fulfilled and replaced by the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this does not need to be reapplied year after year after year. Uh, and this also means that when you came to church today, and I'm, and I'm glad you did, uh, you didn't come to church so that you'd receive some kind of ceremonial forgiveness of your sins for this week, but you better come back next week for, for next week's top-up. I was speaking with uh, a man in my church in, um, in Cork, Ireland, uh, earlier in the year, and I can't get into the details of this. It's, it would be wrong. I mean, he's not in the room, so I could, but <laughs> I don't think I will. That's actually incredibly dis dishonoring and bad pastoral practice. But we were talking about one of the, one of the worst days of his life. And um, one of the things that he's, he's done that brings him the most amount of, of shame and guilt. And as he is describing to me, he's letting me in on this story and, and sharing his darkest day, um, his, his posture, his body, his, he's weighed down, his shoulders are slumped, um, his eyes are down, like he's looking at the floor, his head is weighed down. He's describing it as if he's like watching someone else do it. And 
it's three decades ago and he's living in guilt and in shame uh, over this. And in that conversation and in, in subsequent follow-up conversations to, to be able to, to tell this, this Christian, this believer, my, my brother, to tell him the good news that in Christ, God forgives sin fully and freely and finally and forever. And, and he needed to hear that. And he needs to hear it more, more and more. I wonder if anyone here needs to hear that. That in Christ, even that sin can be fully and freely and finally and forever forgiven. I need to hear this over and over again. Let me tell you a little autobiographical uh, thing. I, I am, uh, in Ireland, we'd call this, I'm the, I'm the product of a, of a mixed marriage. You see, my dad comes from a good stock of Italian Catholics. And see, my mom, she came from a good stock of German Protestants, you know. <laughs> and, and I was brought together as I was created. Those, those genomes and those chromosomes came together. And I inherited uh, the Protestant work ethic and the Catholic guilt complex. <laughs> Boy, do they not mix well together, let me tell you. Uh, it means that I'm oriented in such a way that like, I know there's always much more work to be done and there's, there's, there's things to accomplish and there's engagement with the world and things that ought to be done and, and like a diligence and an inbuilt kind of like perseverance and tenacity that I have. And then I also just know that I never do a good job. It's never good enough. I'm always failing. And so this is hard for me. I don't know if anyone else is, is the same. And if so, guys... I'm sorry, it sucks, doesn't it? It's really rough. Um, but, but the good news, this is, this is like where, where the rubber hits the road, where, where like Christianity kind of goes from theology and ideas to like to, to my life and, and, and maybe yours, is to just consider really like, like it's, it's oh to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Um, that there's the ongoing supply, a never depleting supply of God's grace and God's forgiveness and, of course, his empowerment. But my standing before the Lord and yours is not based on how well you did last week or how good you're going to be next week, but it's based on the perfect sacrifice and the once and for all offering of the Lamb of God. That's good news. So the resurrected Jesus brings lasting restoration to broken people and to a broken world. So this is for broken people. And in this section that we're looking at, I mean, like, Jesus encounters one of them. <laughs> he spends time with one of these broken people. Her name is Mary Magdalene. Um, she's mentioned 12 times in the New Testament. Um, one of the interesting details about her, it says um, elsewhere that she was formerly possessed by seven demons. Guys, I don't know what that means, but it does not sound good. Uh, I guess it's, it's easy to presume that her life was, was hellish uh, before she met the man from heaven. Maybe some of you are aware of this or, or culturally have just picked this up, but uh, church tradition says that, that she was like, involved in prostitution. Um, I'd like to just say, the Bible doesn't say that. Like, I've, re I've read the whole thing. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, the Bible does not say that that was part of her past. Uh, Pope Gregory the Great, he made it official in his sixth century sermon that she was the same as the, the sinful woman that Luke describes who washes Jesus' feet with her hair. Uh, however, the problem is the Bible doesn't say that they're the same person, uh, nor does it even say that the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair was ever involved in prostitution. Um, and I think that's just assumption upon assumption and sloppy and poor biblical interpretation skills. That's what I think. But don't worry. Because in 1969, the Catholic Church corrected that error and admitted the text of the Bible does not support that interpretation. Okay, why am I bringing that up? I actually try pretty hard to like to not take pot shots at like other, other groupings um, ordinarily. I live in Ireland, I've learned to be cautious and careful and sensitive. Um, but guys, I'm on vacation right now. I go, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm saying that for two reasons. Number one. 
Just, just as something for us to know that we don't take religious leaders' words for it when they speak in sermons, uh, when they say things with confidence or clarity or in a convincing manner. Uh, ultimately, what matters most is it's not who's saying it, but, but what does this book say? I think the, the wonderful like, Calvary Chapel legacy that we have is that we're like a, a Bible treasuring people. And, and ultimately, it's not the preacher who has any authority. We're not over this book, but we're, we're submitted under it. And so, sorry, Brian, but like, you know, it's good to have your Bibles open so that we can follow along and then make sure, like, it's not just well spoken, but the real question is, is it right? Does the Bible say that? And if it does, then we're compelled to believe it. But if it doesn't, then it's just the opinion of man. Okay, that's, that's the one thing. Here's the other thing. Okay, hang on a second, Mike. You're saying that Jesus came for, for broken people and that Mary Magdalene, she's a broken person. But then now you're saying, well, she's not a prostitute. So what, what is it? Well, guys, here's, here's the thing. You don't have to be involved in prostitution to be a broken person. And in fact, brokenness takes all forms. And it is um, so damaging if we ever get the idea in our head that there's certain kinds of people and they're the broken ones. And as long as we've never done this or that, well, then we're fine. My friends, Jesus came for broken people and that involves those who have and have not had certain things in their background or in their past. We know that she was under oppression of some sort and Jesus set her free. As I think about this passage, I've wondered to myself, like, what was it like for her on that, on that walk there? Now, now, she was there with like a, a group of women, other passages tell us there, but, but John focuses on her and her alone. And so she's walking there, and I'm just thinking about her walk. And we've already established that she wasn't singing in Christ alone. <laughs> she wasn't anticipating the, the, the resurrection, but, but what was she thinking? I, I wonder, is she just realizing like, okay, I've been oppressed by seven demons, you know? My life was, was hell, you know? My brain was like scrambled eggs. My life was so, and that man, Jesus, he set me free. But now he's dead. What's, are they going to come back? You know, like his, his power, his restoring work that took place in me, is it just kind of, now that he's gone, is it eventually going to come back? Like when you unplug your phone from the charger, like maybe it doesn't die immediately, but it dies eventually. It runs out. Is she thinking, what's my life going to be like now? Do I have to go back to the way that things were? But the reality is that Jesus brings lasting restoration to broken people. And so she is set free. And in the power of the risen Christ, she remains set free. And she's actually given a, a task. She's a broken person. And in verse 17, she is sent to broken people. Did you notice that? Verse 17, he says, Go find my brothers and tell them. There's a Puritan writer by the name of John Flavel, and he comments on the, on the tenderness of Jesus that we see in this passage. He calls his disciples his brothers without the least mention of their cowardice or their previous unkindness. See, like, just basically a few hours earlier, you know, bumping back to, to Friday, you know, in his hour of need, when he wanted some prayer partners, you know, they took a nap instead. Um, in his physical suffering upon the cross, as his hands and feet were, were nailed to wood, but his eyes were free, and perhaps he's looking for a show of support from somebody, it's just a bunch of thoughts and prayers instead of people being there and helping. John was there, there was women there, but 11 out of 12 were not there. And now he's back. And how is he going to come back? Is he going to come back like Terminator 2, Judgment Day? Like, I'll be back. And then he goes on like a revenge mission, you know, like John Wick. Um, but instead, there's these, these people, they let him down. And now they're scared. And now they're hiding. They're in an upstairs room with the door closed, it says. They're full of fear and guilt. But Jesus then, he wants to, to send this woman to tell them the glad news that, that the tomb is empty, yes, but that the Savior is, is risen. 
And so in order to bring comfort, hope, and reassurance to broken people, Jesus commissions and sends a broken person to go bring that news. And if I could say that, like, Guys, welcome to Calvary Marietta. <laughs> you know, welcome, welcome to like biblical Christianity. Like we're all just broken and being put together by the Lord Jesus and then sent to go try and help in his name and by his power. We have a message from him that we have to go and send out into a world that is broken that needs to hear this. So they're embarrassed, they're defeated, they're downcast, but a fellow broken person is the one who is sent to give them the good news. Not only has Jesus risen from the dead, that's good news, but also he considers you still part of his family. He calls you his brothers. Hebrews says that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Not now, not then, not ever. And so... This starts personally, Mary, gets a little bit bigger, the lads, the disciples, but then it's going to go cosmic because it's also to restore a broken world. So in in John 20, verse 15, the question that Jesus asks at the beginning is, um, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Uh, Now that, that phrase, whom are you seeking, it's kind of the exact same thing that he said back in John chapter 1. So the beginning of the book and the end of the book are Jesus asking people, whom are you looking for? What are you looking for? And in each of those, the answer ultimately, though they might not know it, it's, it's himself. What a reminder to us of his awareness of our need and his provision for our lack. And he invites us to even articulate what we're looking for so that he might fulfill it. But also too, this is kind of a calling us back to something even earlier. So she asks this question, or she, he says, what are you looking for? And, and she kind of makes a mistake, right? Did you notice that in the middle of verse 15? Supposing him to be the gardener, she says this. Now, guys, is she talking to the gardener? No, she's not. But yes, she is. So on the one hand, she couldn't be wrong, more wrong, you know? He's not the gardener. But she kind of is right. Because this person that she's talking to, he is the one that earlier in, John's, in John chapter 12, he is the one he talked about a seed. And the seed needs to go into the ground and die. And then it's going to come back and it's going to bear much fruit. Uh, He's the one that says in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. In Isaiah, it says you'll be like a well-watered garden, that the Lord is the one who guides and who gardens. Isaiah 61 says that his righteousness will be like a garden in the early springs with plants springing up everywhere. Guys, our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he's a gardening God. And, And the Bible begins, page one, is God planting a garden and God bringing a man and a woman to live in the garden that he has planted. The book begins with a garden and Revelation 21 and 22 ends with a garden city. From beginning to end, our God is a gardening God. But it's not just the the front end and the back end. Right now, August 13th, 2023, Our God is gardening here and now. Because Jesus is is at work in your life now. And and I believe he's doing some gardening work even as we sit here together. For some, Jesus as the gardener is is breaking up fallow ground in, in your life. Fallow ground is when there's an area that's just fallen into disrepair, disuse. The topsoil becomes so hard that life can't spring through. And so a, a spade or a shovel needs to go in it and upturn it. And it's, and it's painful and it looks like a mess. But fallow ground is being broken up by the gardening Lord. Maybe some of you are, are being watered. Even this morning is a watering experience that your thirsty soul is having like water from above being poured onto it. And there's a refreshment that comes from this morning at Calvary Marietta. Uh, Jesus, the gardener, gets his hands dirty in our lives. 
Maybe for some people, he's been pulling up weeds, things that never should have been there in the first place, but he's reaching down and he's pulling them up. For others, maybe it's pruning. Pruning is when there's something good, but it's cut away and it hurts, but it's so that something healthier can grow back in its place. So my friends, Mary is wrong. He's not the gardener, but she's kind of right because our divine gardener is at work in the past, in the future, and in the present. There's something that I've come across um, a couple years ago, and I I always kind of love this motif. A lot of painters and etchers and artists over the years have kind of picked up on this verse and taken it kind of literally. And in their portrayals of Mary Magdalene at the garden tomb, they have Jesus dressed as a gardener. This is um, Albert Drucher. He's a 16th century German etcher. And we have Jesus holding a spade in his hand here. Uh, Here's another one with uh, another shovel. Um, There he's holding a a gardening hoe. And there again with the the shovel. Now again, I think that's kind of like a bit literalism. I I don't think that he actually was wearing gardening gloves and holding, holding a rake. But I think they're kind of, they're kind of capturing a, a deeper truth than, than they know. And as we finish our sentence, and as we come to an end of, of this sermon, um, I, got, yeah, I, got, I got one more thing to say. You ever like, you're in a concert and you want to encore? Well, you, deep down in your heart, you do want to encore, so that's what you're <laughs> going to get. Oops, nope. Um, so this is also kind of a callback. Um, the scene that we have, whether or not he's holding a shovel or not, again, what we have, it's, it's, a, it's a man and a woman, and they're alone in a garden together. Uh, isn't that kind of how everything started in the first place? And isn't that where everything went wrong in the first place? And then here we have it's all leading up to, to this scene, this image, where that which has gone wrong is beginning to be put right. We have it reimagined. We have it reenacted. It's recapitulated where, where we have Jesus, who was tempted in a garden, just like Adam was so long ago in the Garden of Gethsemane. But, but instead, he obeyed his father. And, and just as how all those years earlier that Adam, well, he blamed somebody else for his sin. Here we have Jesus, who on the cross took the blame for our sin. And instead of sentencing other people to death, as Adam's sin brought death into the world, because of Christ's obedience and his sacrifice, we're given pardon and that full, free, and forever forgiveness that we've been considering this morning. So Dr. Lucy Hogan says that in the first creation story, God drove even Adam out of the garden with weeping and grief. But in this new creation, Jesus sends Mary out of the garden, and she is rejoicing. So as we sang, because he lives... Now we live, and this changes everything. So what started in that first garden continues on until the next garden, and his work of restoration brings forgiveness and new life to us and is a foretaste of glory divine. So the resurrected Jesus brings lasting restoration to broken people and to a broken world. So I'm going to, to pray, and we have a time of, uh, of response, but... Uh, as the worship team comes out, I do want to just um, say, I bet there's people here who need to do a bit, of, a bit of turning. Just like how Mary, she had her back towards Jesus, and he called her name, and so she turned. And instead of her back being towards him, her face was. My friends, that's what repentance is. It's turning from being a, uh, distracted by lesser things and giving our attention to the one who deserves it, the Lord Jesus. 
And so in this final song, which has a celebratory note to it, guys, we have so much to celebrate. I also want to say that some of you need to turn your face towards Jesus uh, because he's there and he is calling your name. So come to him in repentance and faith. Uh, Lord, I pray for the collection of people that are here. Every one of them is broken. Thank you that you're using this broken individual right now to to communicate your message to this collection of brokenness right in front of me. Various needs and challenges, um, various um, sins that might have been mentioned in this sermon or might not have been. Uh, But Lord, there's an equal need that we have. I pray that for those of us that are walking with you, that that walk will grow closer. Uh, For those that have their back towards you, that today would be a time of fallow ground being broken up, of turning from uh, their back towards your face to opening up to hear your name spoken by you. Help us, Lord Jesus. Amen.